Greetings and welcome to this episode of Because I Was Asked. Now, this is a new segment that I'm doing, and I get asked a lot of different things, and people want me to make a video about this and make a video about that. But I was asked by Dr. Harold F. Hunter, uh, who is the father of my co-host Braxton Hunter, uh, to make a video of why do professors choose the textbooks they choose for their courses. He thought that that would be an interesting video, and so do I, because I like talking about that kind of thing. Now, Braxton Hunter, like many uh, people, typically asks me to make videos all the time, and I don't, obviously. Uh, but when Harold F. Hunter, when Braxton's father, asked me to make a video, I do it that day. Uh, so that tells you uh, who I think is more important between the two hunters, at least when it comes to making videos. But I do think it's an interesting question. I don't think that very many people will find this interesting, um, but some might. Um, those of us who are interested in this kind of thing obviously will, and those, uh, I, I don't know, uh, but I was asked to do this. So uh, I like to talk about why I pick the textbooks, because I love books. I love all kinds of books. My least favorite kind of book to read is probably books that are related to biblical studies or theology or apologetics or the things that I actually teach. I actually like to read other stuff uh, more than the stuff that I have to read for work, and that's not because I'm not interested in it, but it's just when you read so much of it, it just kind of, you get burnt out with it, and so you, I always read other things uh, to to mix it up. But I love books. Why do I pick the books that I pick as a professor? Well, uh, a lot of professors uh, at many seminaries, they will get these catalogs, uh, whether they're digital catalogs or in print or whatever. They'll get catalogs from the publishers because they want you to know what's available uh, for the types of courses that are normally taught in seminaries. Publishers like Fortress Press and uh, Baker Academic and BNH Academic and IVP Academic and, and all of those uh, various publishers you may or may not be familiar with. <clears throat> They typically all publish anything from conservative to moderate uh, the, uh, theological uh, products. Um, not Every now and then you'll get like a liberal theologian who contributes to something, but most of it's anywhere from conservative to moderate from these types of publishers. And so uh, how do I go about picking? Well, when you look through the catalogs, um, if you're interested in a course, what you can do is you can go to the publisher's website. If you're a typical seminary, pro seminary professor, and you can ask them to send you a desk copy. A desk copy is complimentary or uh, uh, really discounted uh, in some cases. The, the cheaper publishers who don't just give them away for free, shame on you. Uh, but they'll send you a complimentary copy or a deeply discounted copy um, to review to see if you want to use it for a course. But when you're in my position, uh, some of your uh, some of you seminary professors may not be aware of this, but when you're in my position where you're the vice president of academic affairs and not merely uh, one of the professors at an at a, at a institution, you don't even have to request desk copies. They send you stuff for free that you don't even ask for. Um, so maybe you need to ask your uh, bosses uh, what they've been getting in the mail and see if you can have a look at that. Because I get sent stuff from all these publishers. Why? Because they want to make money. They want to make money because they know that we have a seminary here with a lot of students. And if we assign their books, uh, their their students uh, will buy them. And what's giving uh, one copy away when several hundred people are going to end up buying the book if you pick it? So it's worth the cost to them to give these review copies if you ask for them. Or it's worth it just to send it to me in the hopes that I will use it. Now, I give a lot of this stuff away. I maybe mean, I'm not supposed to say this, um, but when you send it to me that I didn't ask for, it, this what you get coming. Um, but I, I get a lot of books that way. I don't even like print books uh, in this kind of stuff anymore at all. I like all my stuff in Logos. I have uh, these shelves behind me. I have been thinning out uh, my theology. Some of the stuff uh, I have in Logos software anyway, um, some of it I, I don't use anymore because I like having all that stuff in Logos and I've been replacing it with, with, uh, I was going to say I'm replacing it with real books. Uh, but those are real books too. I'm just, I'm replacing it with, uh, other types of literature, fiction and nonfiction alike. 
uh, and trying to get as much of my work-related uh, seminary, theology, ministry, apologetics, biblical study stuff into the Logos software because it's just so much easier to use. And uh, I don't I don't read that stuff in my free time anymore. I'm reading other types of things. But when I have a course that I'm going to teach, I always think about, you know, uh, I having been through seminary myself, uh, some books um, are better than others, and I know that not everyone has the same taste or gets the same things out of out of uh, a book that other people might get out of. Uh, but I try to do my best to get, uh, for me personally, I try to get uh, number one diverse perspectives, uh, something that it's close enough to my view um, that that I usually be lecturing from, and then something that's uh, in an opposing perspective um, to my view. And I know that many of our professors here at Trinity do that because we are a, a non-denominational seminary. We're an interdenominational seminary. A lot of people from a lot of different uh, Christian traditions and denominations come here, and. I want them to be able to, if they're not going to get their view represented from the lecturer, at least I want them to be able to find something close to it in some of the assigned readings. So, and and of course, we try to uh, deal fairly uh, with all the views. We try to teach all the different perspectives and tell why we believe the one that we do. Uh, like a colleague of mine and a friend and a professor here at Trinity by the name of Leighton Flowers, everyone knows that Dr. Flowers is not a Calvinist, and he is um, very much not a Calvinist. Um, and he has a course that he teaches, just not even on the Book of Romans, just Romans 9. It's a special topics course, just on Romans 9. And in this course, he assigns, of course, his book. But you know what else he assigns? He, he assigns uh, to some students, he'll assign James White's The Potter's Freedom uh, as an as a alternative book. That, that you have to purchase and you read those side by side. The Justification of God by John Piper is a book that's dedicated to, in large part, to uh, Romans 9. Um, so, uh, Brian Abbasiano's uh, books on Romans 9 and the intertextuality gets assigned as, as well. Um, and, of course, that's more towards Leighton Flower's side uh, of the debate. But... Um, they also have different ways that they nuance Romans 9 too, because even non-Calvinist readings differ from one another. Um, but that's the kind of thing that you will find at Trinity. So one of the things that we're looking for, and one of the things that I'm looking for, is something that I think is going to be very helpful to the students, but also represents um, uh, enough of a swath of perspectives uh, that that... Even if you don't agree with your professor's take on it, your professor will represent your view fairly, and in your assigned readings, you're going to read um, the opposite view. Uh, sometimes there's multiple views, and sometimes in those courses, uh, if you're on a particular subject, I have a whole course that uses nothing uh, but those Zondervan counterpoint series, and we just go through the different perspectives because the course is about teaching the different perspectives of different theological issues, and the topics change depending on who's teaching the course. When I teach it, it's uh, inerrancy, and uh, we read the, and the historical Adam, and women in ministry, and uh, the gifts. I think is what uh, what I cover in that course. And, of course, we have the, the those counterpoints. We use those types of books as well. Um, and, yeah, you got to read all of them, but, and that's always fun to see. Oh, man, we got four books in this course and got to read every bit of it. Yeah, uh, you do, because we make sure by assigning priest assignments. Now, do we just assign academic books? That's uh, one of the questions that Dr. Hunter had asked me because you, you basically have two different types of views, more like popular level or devotional type books. Uh, and then you have like the academic type books, you know, with footnotes or without footnotes. That's one way to do it. Uh, you, you can divide those up. Uh, and I am not opposed to, uh, using popular level works if they're better than some of the more academic level works based on the content of the book. If it's helpful and you learn something from it, it doesn't matter to me whether or not it's an academic book or a popular level book. Um, if it's on a particular subject that I think is helpful. So, um, 
some people, some popular level books also have footnotes, by the way. That, that, that's just, that's just a very broad way of, of dividing, uh, the world. But, uh, misreading scripture through Western eyes is what I would, I would consider that more popular level book, uh, than others. But in our undergraduate Bible backgrounds class, because it's got a lot of help content in it, uh, that's one of the books that's assigned, but it's not necessarily the most heady academic book out there on the subject of, of, um, ancient Mediterranean and ancient Near Eastern backgrounds. But but that is one of the books that we'll assign. So it's not as simple as saying, oh, this work is an academic textbook type, uh, so we're going to use that instead of something that was written at the popular level. Also, I don't always feel the need to go with um, the most popular or the most... Uh, you know, the most best-selling or the most academic work out there. Um, I don't have to go with just major publishers. If there is a person out there who's reasonably scholarly enough, who has self-published a book, I'm not opposed to using it if it's helpful. Um, so I don't just look through the catalogs and try to put together cookie-cutter stuff. Every now and then the catalogs will have something interesting, but most of the interesting books that you want to use for your courses typically aren't the kind of standard textbook, you know, systematic theology designed for undergraduates or systematic theology designed for ministry students. In fact, the students in our master's degree programs that are taking systematic theology one and two, they're going to read Thomas Oden's uh, Classic Christianity and uh, William Shedd's Dogmatic Theology. Now, neither one of those are new, are the most recent. Um, neither one of those were ne uh, necessarily written with the seminary in mind, but we believe here at Trinity that those are the most helpful to our students. Uh, and those, uh, maybe those are also happen to be my two favorite systematic theology books. Um, I used dogmatic theology when I was in my master's program at a different institution, and I recommend it to everybody. And, of course, I don't agree with a lot of it because, as most people know, I'm not a Calvinist myself, uh, and the author is. But it's a fantastic one, and, of course, Odin's one of my favorites anyway. So um, we use those. Uh, I don't teach the course, but I recommended those as the textbooks, um, and they will probably remain that way until my colleague Adam Harwood finally finishes up his, and we will most certainly assign it... Uh, either at the master's level or the undergraduate. Uh, it depends on where he situates that. Um, it, but it, it'll be in one of those uh, uh, courses for sure. Um, but that's basically how we go about it. I want to find what is the most helpful book to our students. And because they typically buy multiple books per course, I want to make sure that there's a good spread uh, that's not just repeating what you're going to hear from the lecturer, whether it's my course or any of our professors here. Um, most of the professors at Trinity select their own books or they ask for recommendations. Um, and then of course, you know, uh, I don't get involved in too much of that unless I'm asked. And I, I typically, typically am asked because I just, not to pat myself on the back, but I've read a lot uh, and, I, and I've surveyed or at least skimmed and whatever, a whole lot of material. And so I kind of have a good sense of what's out there. Most of it's redundant. Most of it's not any good, to be honest with you. Uh, some of it is. Uh, but um, I typically agree with Scott McKnight, who said, you know, if you can avoid using textbooky type textbooks, uh, assigned readings for your courses, you should. And he's right. Um, a lot of these are cookie cutter, new, you know, especially when it comes to New Testament survey, Old Testament survey. There's a gazillion of those. Um, and, and while many of them do different things, uh, some are better than others. Um, and other types of courses, you don't necessarily have to use those standard type, uh, books that are geared to be used in those courses when there are other alternatives out there, uh, written by maybe even a single author or maybe one or two authors who are, who are communicating a specific point of view. Uh, and you want to engage deeply with their thoughts, and that kind of book might actually be better for teaching than a standard typical textbook stuff. 
So I agree with Scott McKnight there as well. Uh, usually on uh, Bible courses, for example, we try to select a few commentaries and a few theological uh, books related to the books of the Bible, and you'll get the same thing. You'll we every seminary uh typically has its own identity and so in our biblical studies and and uh biblical theology courses and and our bible book cor- courses on you know either a corpus or a single book of the bible you're going to find uh many of the same authors keep showing up uh because these series editors to commentaries keep pick, picking the same scholars to write in all of them uh which i think is not necessarily uh, a good thing all the time, but it's not necessarily bad too, because you, you get familiar with certain authors and you find their stuff reliable. But of course, a lot of the books, uh, that we assign at Trinity in our biblical studies type, uh, courses are going to be more dealing with socio-cultural background type stuff, as well as uh, other issues, you know, the theological readings and things like that. So, but that's kind of our slant here. Um, I know that, uh, in our, Preaching courses, um, and Dr. Elliot uh, teaches several of those. Um, I know that, of course, his doctorate is actually not in preaching at all. It's just in communications. And, of course, he's steeped in rhetoric. So a lot of his are going to be more rhetoric-based uh, and persuasion-based uh, than, than just normal forms of communication. Uh, and then he's, he's going to bring in a lot of, you know, kind of the Aristotle um, type stuff uh, as far as ancient Greco-Roman rhetoric, um, Quintilian and all that. Uh, that's kind of his flavor for his preaching courses, for example. So you're going to find a lot of that in there. Uh, but every seminary is different. But but for us, we pick our books based on, number one, what do we think is going to be most helpful? Number two, what is going to be most helpful in communicating the the broadest swath of views um, that are going to be uh, differentiated from what just the lecturer is saying and maybe the textbook that he picks as closest to his own view. We want to make sure that people get uh, differing perspectives so that they have to wrestle with all of those perspectives. Uh, and I think that's that's education. You know, we're in, in, insofar as we can, all the professors try to, uh, to do that with different points of view in the textbook assignings. Uh, and represent the views when they're talking about the views that they don't agree with, representing them as fairly as they possibly can. So that's what goes into us uh, here at Trinity. I can't speak for all seminaries everywhere, but those are what, what comes to us. It doesn't matter if it's a mainstream publisher or not. It doesn't matter uh, if it's a academic or popular level work. We want to make sure that our students get the best education possible with the best textbooks possible. Um Everyone who goes to uh, college or seminary inevitably tries to sell some of their textbooks back. Um, it's not quite as bad as secular universities where textbooks can cost about $125 or whatever. Most of our books don't, a single book doesn't, isn't going to cost you that at all. Um, but still, I want to be able to help people build solid libraries, especially in the undergraduate uh, programs. We want our students to build solid libraries that they're just getting started with. Uh, and I, th- we want to make sure that we can pack in there as many books as that will, they will find useful that they don't want to resell as possible. That, that's our goal. That you buy the books and that you keep the books for life as, uh, you build your, uh, theological library. That's, that's what I think about, uh, when I assign books. That's what I w- hope that all my professors, and I think that all my professors are doing that very thing. What will be useful for them for the rest of their life that they will keep and then inevitably pass on to either their children or other seminary students when they've gotten uh, all that they can get out of their book collections and their wives are like, you have too many books, you got to get rid of them. Um, my wife has informed me that even as I dwindle my my physical copies of books down and even replace them uh, on my shelves um, and go go more ebooks and then have hard copy books for, for again, real books. Uh, she said, they're not all coming home with you. And, um, I don't think that my kids are going to want, uh, Thomas Schreiner's commentary from Baker on Romans. It's not even the second edition. It's the first edition. If you see it back there, uh, you know, they're not going to want that stuff. 
Uh, so some other uh, seminary student or maybe a local minister or stuff. That's just what we all do. Uh, many of the books that you see, uh, not on the back wall, uh, but along this wall here, um, many of those books um, were given to me by other professors and, and other pastors who, who have said that their wives won't let them take those books home uh, <laughs> and that they're not going to need them anymore. Uh, they've moved on to other things, you know, they're, they're enjoying their retirement or, or getting into other types of reading material. So uh, that's what we do. Um, and it's a blessing to be able to acquire a lot of books and it's a blessing to pass them on. Um, so that's what I think about what is going to be the most helpful to our students that they will not want to resell. Uh, and that goes to whether it's popular level or if it's an academic book and we will assign both, we'll assign whatever we think is useful. So, um, 20 minute video on a topic that I don't know you might find interesting you might not but I hope that that gives you a little bit of insight to at least what we do at Trinity uh, if not at other seminaries but um, you know you can always request reading lists from seminaries you're thinking about going to and see if you can get an idea of what they're gonna be assigning um, or sometimes you can find uh, other schools have uh, other seminaries and Bible colleges will have some of their uh, course syllabi, like samples of them online, you can look at what they're reading, uh, or you can email them, ask them what they're reading. Because when you're going to spend money to get a, an education, you ought to, whether it is for any, uh, when going to any college or seminary, uh, even if you're going to go into an accounting program, when when you're looking at a universe, say you're doing a campus tour with your your kids and, and you want to go to this campus and you're looking around, make a stop by the bookstore and look at the course codes and find a catalog if you don't have one about whatever degree program they're interested in and go look at what they're going to re be reading. Um, and do that if you're wanting to go to a, you know, any kind of institution, whether it's secular or a Christian institution, whether it's a ministry related degree program or any kind of degree program, go see what you're going to be reading. Cause guess what? If you're the student, you're going to have to read it. So one way or the other. So it's always helpful to say, what is the reading list? And then you can see is, uh, once you compile all that, uh, maybe for three or four courses, if on balance these are things that you are interested in reading, you got to go to that seminary. If you find out that um, I have no interest in reading any of this stuff, um, that's a good sign that maybe you don't want to go to that seminary. Maybe, you know, yeah, it's the seminary with that name, but I don't want to read those books by those theologians because that's going to be very, very boring. So even though it's a seminary and it maybe has that one professor or maybe two professors that I want to learn from, do I really want to spend years of my life reading stuff that I'm not going to enjoy? Probably not. Uh, so that's another thing to consider. Uh, so I do think that textbooks are important when considering where you're going to go to seminary as much as professors and the name recognition of the institution and all that. So. Uh, just another thing, but that's what uh, we think about at Trinity when it comes to textbooks. And uh, thank you for watching this because I was asked, and we'll see you next time. Bye.